Hi, Anushka. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. You can hear me, right? Yeah, very faint, but but you too. Okay, okay, great. How are you? Good, good, good. So far, so good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cool. We'll wait for a bit. Usually people take about five to seven minutes to all log in and then we can start. Uh, also, the talk is being recorded, okay? Yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait.
अनुष्का हाय हेलो आई वाज जस्ट लुकिंग एट योर ईमेल या देयर इज अ डिफरेंस इन द या 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 आई नोटिस सो आई हैड सेंट अनदर ईमेल टू विद द करेक्ट डिटेल्स आई एम नॉट श्योर यू रिसीव्ड इट आई हैड सेंट इट टू योर फ्रेंड बट ओके लेट टू सेंड इट अराउंड इट्स ओके ओ ओके yeah yeah thanks for noticing uh, we also noticed it a couple of days ago so we sent like a newer version to everyone yeah thank you <laughs> glad you could join happy to be here i think we can begin now parag are you ready yeah very much very much yeah great so uh, a warm welcome to everyone for today's scientist share series uh and i'm super excited that parag is here with all of us today uh so i'll just introduce parag a little uh i think many of us know him already so he requires no introduction uh but i'll give a short one anyway uh parag ramnikar is an ecologist based in goa uh and his work has focused on the documentation of uh, smaller bodied fauna uh, such as butterflies dragonflies uh and he's also worked a lot in conservation action uh, via community participation uh he is an expert member on the goa state biodiversity board uh, also on the goa tourism board uh, and he is also a member of the invertebrate conservation information network for south asia uh he is also the founding president of goa bird conservation network uh and he was awarded the lead fellowship uh, which is the leadership for environment and development fellowship foundation of goa and he is responsible for planning and executing developmental projects in the mining belt of goa uh, parag operates a travel company uh, by the name of mugai expedition uh, and mugai expedition conducts birding and wildlife tours throughout the country uh, and he also operates mugai nature retreat which is an eco resort in amboli uh, in maharashtra uh, he was awarded the responsible tourism pathfinder award in 2019 Uh, by the outlook responsible tourism initiative and he was also featured in the con nas traveler as one of the 50 champions of sustainable travel now uh, para also has 15 research papers to his credit and various other articles including the description of two uh, odonid species that are new to science a species of wasp has been named after him uh, called kudrakrumia rangnikari kudrakrumia rangnikari sorry um and he has also authored uh, a catalog on birds of goa for the wwf goa chapter uh, he also authored the well acclaimed uh, a photographic guide to butterflies of india uh, and the list can go on but at this point i will uh, give the floor over to parag and a very warm welcome and a big thank you to you again parag for making time for us for this today uh, and over to you thanks a lot thank you sir thank you very much and uh... good to see some familiar faces so uh, let me share this presentation so right, is it in the uh, full screen mode in the yeah okay perfect so uh, good afternoon evening guys and uh, so let me start with a disclaimer you know this is a scientist share forum and i don't think you know i can i qualify as a scientist i'm just somebody who is interested in the natural world you know and you know, try to document and you know uh, do whatever little that i i can manage to um i'm going to switch off my uh, video just to you know get some bandwidth sorry just a second you have to give me a moment all right okay <clears throat> um so you know as uh, uh, somebody who is interested in uh, wildlife nature i've been you know uh, also doing uh, nature excursions you know a little bit of environment edu education work with students and um, i remember th those days you know maybe 15 years back when uh, we used to take children out on nature trails you know identify a few birds for them butterflies for them uh, but when it came to dragonflies you know um, we just knew that the one with you know 
sturdier wings, bigger body. It was a dragonfly, and the slender one was a damselfly. So, this is this was the, you know, um, second. Why is it not moving? Okay, right. So this was the only thing that we knew. Um, kids used to ask us names, you know, but we absolutely had no idea. Uh, 15 years back, I don't think there were any field guides. There were no 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 books around, uh, you know, which would help us identify. You know, unlike in case of birds, where there are quite a few few field guides available. Uh, I think uh, that was a time when you know, like everybody else, I was personally interested in butterfly uh, in, in birds, and then kind of moved on to butterflies. Uh, you know, and I was documenting butterflies. Uh, during which time I met a few people, including one um, Dr. Andrew. Uh, from Hislop College in Nagpur, you know, and that's an interesting story that actually uh, got me interested into dragonflies, or rather, you know, uh, kind of, you know, aroused my curiosity. Uh, so he was here uh, with his uh, family, you know, uh, it was a family holiday for him, and he connected saying that, why don't we meet up and, you know, uh, discuss. So he, I remember meeting him in the church square, you know, uh, near the Kamath Hotel, and he had bought some books for me, you know, he is a uh, teacher in a college, but also somebody who researches on, um, you know, the breeding uh, biology of uh, dragonflies, especially uh, he studies eggs. Okay, so it's a very specialized field. And uh, he casually asked me, you know, do you know how many dragonflies are found in Goa? And I said, uh, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, yeah, I, I told him that we, you know, see quite a few, but I've never really, you know, looked at them seriously in terms of identification. So he said, you know, uh, once I go back, uh, there's, I, that, you know, he remembered that there was a paper published on dragonflies of Goa, and then he would send it to me. So I said, okay, and, you know, those good old days, you know, that uh, sent to me post. Uh, when we actually uh, checked that, you know, he said, uh, this was, you know, 2005, 2006. And, you know, he said there are 22 species reported from Goa. You know, that paper uh, spoke about 22 species. And then, you know, he kind of uh, said, that you, I think, probably need to explore your state. Uh, you need to look at, uh, you know, the dragonflies for your state. Uh, I'm sure you'll find something interesting. So those, that paper came to, uh, uh, you know, came to me. and. Um, this was something that was published in 1995. Now, this is another interesting story is that immediately after liberation, 1961, uh, the Zoological Survey of India came to Goa. They came to Goa in the year 63-64 and uh, surveyed the state for dragonflies. <clears throat> I'm not sure what took them you know, nearly 30 years for uh, the findings to be published, but uh, the paper was published in 1995 with 22 species. Uh, sometime during, you know, when my curiosity, you know, kind of uh, was getting aroused, uh, Dr. Manoj Borakar from Carmel College, you know, in Nuem, yeah. uh, he and his students did a survey of uh, dragonflies around uh, the college campus. That was 2006. And in 2008, uh, Fauna of Goa was published. This was, a, uh, again, a ZSI publication, which listed, you know, uh, quite a bit of taxa, including birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. And it also included dragonflies and it had 39 species. And so all these kind of, uh, you know, we as somebody who, who used to, you know, regularly go on the field uh, and we used to, all of us, you know, interested in photography, we remember taking a lot of photographs of, you know, dragonflies, uh, never really bothering to identify them. But then we realized that we surely have, you know, a lot more pictures than what has been published. So, you know, me and, uh, you know, my uh, friend and partner now, uh, Omkar, we surveyed uh, Goa, uh, you know, for, you know, like nearly six, seven uh, months. Uh, we kept all the birds and butterflies aside and we started looking at dragonflies. Um, we went to 16 different locations, you know, all those numbers are really, I mean, uh, not really important. <laughs> But we were dependent on one book. This was a PDF um, called Dragonflies of India by uh, Dr. Subramanian. And this was the only resource then. Uh, but just with this resource, 
we managed to uh, add 34 new records you now within less than a year to the state uh, uh, you know um, odonate numbers and which included four new families you know because zsi for some reason did not really survey the interiors you know in the the forested areas and we were more partial towards forested areas so we ended up finding quite a you know bit of uh, new new uh, records um i'll move uh, you know i rather digress a little bit just to you know emphasize to everybody the need for you know why why suddenly you know so many records were found in goa now uh, it's important to understand historically uh, you know why natural history in this state you know has not really been documented well um the british did a excellent uh, job for the rest of the country but goa as all of us know uh, you know was under the portuguese uh, those guys probably were not interested and you know that rubbed off on us um, so the british i mean the british obviously did not come to goa for their service uh, the portuguese were not interested and after liberation you know um, the institutions uh, within the state also did not you know look at natural history really seriously so our it was a huge knowledge gap as we call it now uh, as far as um, you know having a baseline of what we have you know we are fairly now uh, comfortable with the the bird list for example or you know what mammals we have uh, but when it comes to insects our knowledge is very very poor this is one of the reasons why you know we'll spend uh, time exploring on the field and you know trying to identify uh, this was we published uh, these findings uh, so suddenly you know um, everybody took notice uh, 34 new records is a huge thing you know in one paper and um, uh, got pats on our backs you know everybody you know suddenly congratulating you and you know it's it encourages you to look further uh, to explore more and um, you know but things are not easy you know um, as you as you start um, you know exploring more you know I, i think there's a saying which says that the, the more you know you know i mean probably the lesser you know so you know um, or something of that sort you know i'm not very sure what you know the, what specific that uh, saying is but primarily it means that you know the more you get deeper into a subject uh, you know you realize that you know you need to explore more you need to learn more so uh, dragonflies are not easy subjects let me tell you they are very colorful they are all over the place but uh, on your screen now you see uh, this red colored uh, you know um, individuals i'm sure many of you have seen these red bodied uh, insects around water bodies in your paddy fields uh, but let me tell you all these three are three different species and the differentiation is you know very subtle uh, you need to know what you know what and where to look at it or you know what characters to look for to be able to separate these species i will not get into the names or you know um, uh, what the id characters are because that's you know another uh, uh, probably an hour of uh, uh, you know discussions but the point here is that um, after a point you know uh, say 50 60 species um, identifying dragonflies just based on um, images Uh, is a big no uh, you need to you know look at so many different characters probably catch the insect you know look at it look at it closely um, and then i'm sure everybody has seen the red bodied dragonflies i'm sure you have seen the blue ones as well okay again species which share the same habitat uh, you know the same niche sometimes sitting next to each other look very you know very similar to each other but again you know very fine differences you know just to point out uh, uh, on the screen now the one uh, on top um, you know um, the one character that you have to look at is the face so if you look at the um, and if you know my cursor can point it uh, the face of this one is darker whereas the one below and you can see it here the face is pale okay so if you do not see uh, or you do not know what to look for then there's no way you know you can separate these uh, two species uh, so dragonfly identification is not easy um, it it takes time and then you know as like i said you know you dwell deeper things get a little more complicated um again two species uh, or two images on your uh, screen 
uh, when we published our first paper, um, we made a mistake. Okay, and um, it of course needs to be rectified. Um, the image that you see at the bottom of your screen, um, we identified it as Agriochnemis femina, uh, whereas it is actually just an old specimen of the one on top. Okay, that's Agriochnemis pygmy. Now, why did we make this mistake? We made this mistake because you know we went by the colors, and that blue color that you see on the thorax, um, femina has that kind of uh, markings. So we thought this was femina, but it was not. So it's just like I said, you know, old specimens develop these uh, pronouns on their on their body. So we made that mistake because we relied on colors. Um, so this is another way. I mean, uh, when a when a, a dragonfly emerges, it doesn't have you know the brighter colors; it's dull colored. Colors slowly start developing as the as the dragonfly ages, and as it ages further, the colors change. Okay, so uh, relying on colors, you know, is not um, the best way. Like you know, we learned it the hard way. Um, so yes, as you look at them closer, you know, your problems kind of compound. And then uh, females are even even difficult. Um, and I'm not saying it in a uh, you know sexist way, but primarily females are difficult because uh, they have various forms. Uh, most of the keys that you uh, see in book uh, are based on males. Uh, females uh, are not very uh, you know they don't come out uh, in the open. They are always in the undergrowth. Uh, they are dull colored. And then you know they have different color morphs, like what you see on your screen. The one bottom on the at the in the bottom of your screen is a normal looking female, whereas the same species will have a red colored morph. And then there will be another morph, you know, which is the rarer one, but which looks exactly like the male. So it has, you know, a female can have two three different forms, which makes identification on the field really really difficult. Okay, so you know, not trying to scare anybody who's interested in dragonfly studies, but um, the point here is that just Photographing and looking at uh, uh, you know uh, on them on the field is not enough. So then, what do you have to do? Well, you have to look at wing venations. Um, dragonflies have amazing wings. You know, one thing is that uh, uh, unlike uh, other insects, you know, where um, uh, wings bit together, uh, here all the four wings can operate in different planes. You know, one of the reasons why they are amazing flyers. Um, one of those. You know, few insects which can actually fly backwards, um, and that's I mean they have developed this skill because they are aerial predators. They catch their prey on wing, um, and wings are very very sturdy. Um, as kids, I'm sure many many of you have you know caught dragonflies. Um, what we used to do is to catch them by their tail. You know, I mean it's not the tail; it's actually the abdomen. Um, but that's the wrong thing to do because you know they are very fragile. But you catch a dragonfly by the wing and you know, it's fine because their wings are quite tough, and when they can with, withhold the, or rather, you know, uh, withstand the the you know rough handling. So they're amazing, you know, uh, dragonfly wings. Uh, and you have to look at these. There are certain specific characters on the wings that you have to look at to be able to uh, character, you know, kind of uh, classify them. They look beautiful, but then when you look at it as somebody who documents. Um, and you know, studies dragonflies when you are looking at them under the microscope. This is how confusing they are. Okay, each cell has a different name. Each vein has a name. And again, I won't get into naming all those abbreviations that you see on your screen. But uh, uh, you know, this is what you really have to look at. This is the uh, picture that needs to come in front of your eyes when you close your you know close your eyes. You know, as a dragonfly researcher. So these are what you see on your screen are dragonfly wings. Very interestingly. Uh, the forewing and the hindwing, which is you know at the bottom of the screen, um, they are different. Okay, they they are different in shape and size. Whereas in case of the damselfly, uh, the hindwing and the forewing, you know, are very similar in uh, shape and size. So this is another differentiation between these two two groups. And then as you look at them closely, you know, you know, you have to look at different veins and you know how they pass the different cells. Uh, you you have to look at. And again, you know, I won't get into that. I'm just trying to emphasize on the complexity of you know doing proper scientific taxonomic work and that's again just looking at the wing venation is not enough um, you have to look at the 
and their appendages. So on the 10th, uh, so uh, a dragonfly abdomen will have 10 abdominal segments. And on the 10th abdominal segment, the male has something called anal appendage. Okay. And the shape and the size of the anal appendage um, will help you pin down what species you are looking at. So, which means, you know, you have to uh, look at a, uh, look at them really, really close, which means you got to invest in a microscope, which means, you know, it costs a lot of money. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so it's, it's just not about, you know, you having interest, you know, you need to really invest time, energy, money into um, studying dragonflies. Um, and then you have to look at them dorsally. You have to look at them ventrally. Okay. Uh, uh, this is interesting. On the left, left hand side, um, those black dots that you see here appear like dots when you look at them from this angle. But when you look at them laterally, they are actually spines. Okay. So, uh, looking at them ventrally, uh, dorsally, laterally, you know, is, is uh, very, very important uh, to be able to pin down the species. Um, again, emphasizing on the complexity of, you know, studying a subject. Um, uh, why anal appendages are important, you know, is, uh, I think this is a excellent example. Uh, what you see on the top of the screen are two similar looking species. In the field, uh, there is no way you can separate them. Uh, because, like I said earlier, you shouldn't go by the colors. Um, they are very similar looking, both uh, both of the same genus. Um, one is Copera vitata, and the other is Copera marginibus. Now, only looking at the anal appendages will tell you the difference. And uh, let me explain to you. Um, if you look here, uh, these are called the superior anal appendages, and the ones below are called the inferior anal appendages. Now, in this case. The superior anal appendages are half the size of the inferiors. Whereas in case of this one, the uh, superiors are less than one fourth the size of the inferiors. This is the only uh, confirmatory test, you know, uh, to separate these two species. Uh, one of the reasons why looking at the anal appendages under the microscope, very, or, you know, if you have good uh, equipment, take good sharp, you know, macro pictures, uh, you'll be able to separate these two species. Field identification is not easy. And then in some cases, you have to look at the secondary genitalia. Males, you know, have something called secondary genitalia on the second abdominal segment. And I'll talk about, you know, the use of this uh, in the next slide. Um, in some cases, you have to not just look at them, you have to dissect them uh, to be able to, you know, look at uh, the internal parts, which means you have to catch the insect, which means you have to kill the insect, which means you have to preserve the insect. You no, know, put it under to put it under the microscope. Um, so it's 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 just not you know some um, hobby. Uh, this is serious uh, scientific work. All right, I'm sure uh, many of you have seen this. Uh, dragonflies, you know, are amazing creatures. Okay, they are really really ancient. Um, I guess uh, they are evolved around more than you know 300 million years ago during the uh, Carboniferous era. Um, and they have, uh, you know, seen three extinctions, three mass extinctions, and probably they are looking at the fourth. Um, so I'm, I'm sure they'll survive when humans are not there on this planet. Um, this is, you know, a very uh, interesting, this is called the wheel, okay? Uh, this is the mating uh, that happens in case of the dragonflies. Now, uh, this one on top is the male, okay? What it does is that it holds the female uh, by uh, very crudely, we call it by the neck, but it's not the neck, it's the thorax or the prothorax with the help of its anal appendages. Okay, it holds the female. Then the female bends her abdomen, okay, to collect the sperm packets from the second abdominal segment. Okay, so that is why the only the male has a sec secondary uh, genitalia uh, or, or the, on the second abdominal segment. Another way to differentiate between a male and a female. Okay, so this is referred to as the wheel, and uh, this is how uh, this is a just a cropped close-up image of the male holding onto the female. And um, you know, egg laying happens uh, uh, again. They are water dependent, so half of their life cycle is spent underwater, and then you know, uh, so this transformation from um, you know, a watery abode to being, you know, amazing uh, flyers in the sky is, you know, very drastic. 
you know, people speak about this uh, transformation of butterflies, which of course is amazing. Uh, but I personally think the transformation of dragonflies, you know, from a watery, uh, you know, a water abode to the sky is much more dramatic, much more, you know, uh, beautiful. Um, and, you know, some dragonflies lay eggs uh, just directly into the water, while some um, actually lay eggs in um, on submerged vege vegetation, like in this case. And we have seen and documented the females go completely underwater for more than 20 minutes as they are laying eggs, you know, uh, on this submerged aquatic vegetation. 20 minutes they are underwater, you know, it's amazing how they, how they do this. So while the female is laying eggs, what's the male up to? Well, uh, the male is guarding the female and there are uh, two ways of, you know, uh, guarding. Um, in this case, what you see on your screen is called uh, contact guarding. And you can actually see the egg mass, you know, uh, that the female is carrying. So the male, you know, keeps on holding to the female as the female is laying eggs, uh, you know, in, in, in water or on vegetation. Whereas in this case, you see that the female, the male is not holding on to the female. Okay. But what you don't see in the picture is that the male is hovering around, chasing any potential danger or any potential other male, you know, trying to capture the female. Okay. So he, so this is called non-contact guarding. Okay. So amazing behavior, you know, as um, while you're looking at dragonflies, you know, trying to identify species, there's so much more that you get to learn. Uh, this is how a dragonfly nymph looks underwater. Okay. And um, this is how a damselfly uh, nymph looks underwater. Okay. So again, uh, much more slender uh, dragonfly uh, nymphs are, you know, much more um, uh, kind of able-bodied. But again, you know, they come in different shapes and sizes. I won't get into uh, those details. But underwater also, they can be separated. And um, emerge, I mean, uh, emergencies are something, something, you know, really, really uh, interesting. Um, many uh, of us, you know, rare butterflies. Uh, we have read quite a few, you know, butterflies. So it's, it's easy. It's a piece of cake compared to rearing um, dragonflies because uh, butterflies have to be played, I know, uh, fed leaves. It's, it's easy. You just collect uh, fresh leaves and feed the caterpillar and he's happy. A dragonfly nymph is a predator. Okay, it needs to be fed uh, live uh, feed. Okay, and it's not easy. Let me tell you, I've reared a few dragonflies and it's really, really tough uh, to be regular. And they're gluttons. They keep on feeding, you know, as you, uh, as you uh, feed them, they'll keep on eating. So, but yes, that's something that needs to be done. So you can see actually, and this is uh, clockwise, basically. This one has, is just emerging from the uh, mold. And here you see that the wings are not developed. Here you see that the wings are you know, slowly developing as the you know, heart is pumping you know, the hemolymph into the wings. And here the wings are completely developed. And look at the color. It has no colors at all. You know, uh, It's only as it starts aging that the colors start developing. Okay, So this is you know, how the emergence happens. And uh, dragonflies, like I said, you know, they are voracious feeders. Uh, you know, very, and then there are some, you know, who are, uh, they'll catch anything that they can overpower, okay, um, including uh, members of its own, uh, you know, same species. So they are, they uh, are known to be cannibals as well, okay. Um, so, and, and sorry, and underwater also, uh, they are predators, okay. So here you can see a dragonfly, uh, you know, name feeding on a, you know, a fish. So, yes. And they are excellent uh, indicators of the health of the water system. Okay, so like I said, they are so much dependent on um, water that uh, uh, the presence or absence of a certain species can tell you that you know something good or bad is happening with your water body. Okay, and that's we we call such uh, species indicator species. You know, they indicate that uh, uh, you know indicate the health of the ecosystem that they live in. And dragonflies are one of the best indicator species. Uh, a few interesting um, uh, examples. What you see on your screen is uh, called the granite ghost. Um, this is a species which likes to perch on, you know, rocks and, you know, uh, on the ground. Um, it's known to, you know, it's a little, you know, kind of uh, crepuscular in its habitat, in its habit. And um, it's also known to feed a lot on uh, 
you know your mosquitoes okay so they are excellent biocontrols as well uh, you know they feed exclusively on other insects and this one on your screen is a specialist um, mosquito feeder um another uh, interesting species uh, read the name you know it says brachythemis contaminata the species name contaminata basically you know it's kind of referring to uh, the ability of this dragonfly to breed in you know uh, contaminated water as well so if you have a water body around your uh, uh, the place that you live um, and you see this species more in number compared to others then you probably it's an indication that you know okay something's wrong with, with you know with the water body um, uh, not that you know it doesn't breed in good water it does breed in good water but if you see more of these uh, more numbers of these species compared to others then you know it's a, it's a good indicator that something's wrong okay so this is another indicator species called the ditch jewel the name it's a jewel of course it looks beautiful but it's called the ditch jewel and probably the most amazing insect this is called the wandering glider or the globe trotter you know it's got quite a few common names uh, pantala flavescens and this insect undertakes one of the most arduous and you know the more the, the longest known insect migration in the world um, this is what it does okay it flies uh, between the indian subcontinent and africa across you know the the uh arabian sea and the the indian ocean uh, it's absolutely amazing the longest known um, uh, migration which is quite famous is obviously the monarch butterflies which uh, uh, migrate between the uh, you know north north america and, and the south uh, but that's a line, land migration okay here the insect is flying across seas open seas okay and it's it's really crazy you know for a, such a tiny insect to be flying between uh, continents but they're smart insects okay so what they do is that uh, they uh, ride the winds and this migration is related with the uh, the wind currents the southwest monsoons and the uh, northeast so uh, basically you know uh, as the monsoon uh, kind of um, starts um, you know receding in the in the country in india you will see this uh, large number of uh, dragonfly suddenly filling up the sky you know so these are the guys who are ready ready to you know cross over now and as the wind start moving you know, they they fly down into into kenya uh, into, i mean into into the uh, uh, into africa where they breed and the next generation then you know flies back okay and they ride the southwest uh, uh, monsoon winds what is interesting here is that there seems to be a correlation between the uh, amur falcon migration that happens you know again between africa and asia uh because amurs as you know are um, uh, insect feeders and there seems to be some kind of a you know connection between the migration of this dragonfly and the amur falcon migration so uh, like i said they are amazing amazing insects okay um coming specifically to coming back to goa um, globally some 5700 odd species are known uh, india has 499 you know very close to 500 south india has around 200 species uh, like i said earlier uh, till 1995 goa uh, had only 22 species published of course uh, slowly you know we started looking at them and uh, those new species which anushka spoke about and i'll speak about them in a while uh, we ended up uh, publishing uh, two new species uh, to science and that's you know something that's uh, you know very very interesting um we already have 15 new records in print um, right now there are 91 published uh, records uh, from the state uh, whereas we uh, have 108 confirmed species you know as of now um, and possibly possibly one uh, species which is uh, new to science so that's that's goa for you goa is unique guys um, because it is at the confluence of the uh, northern and the southern sahyadris okay so we have our we have our affinity towards the northern western ghats as well as we have elements from the southern western ghats and then possibly we believe that we have uh, you know elements of our own okay so that's something that you know everybody should be proud of because goa you know is is unique in that sense also oh, so this was the first species that we uh, described uh, it's called uh, idionyx gomantakensis after the uh, old name of goa 
call the Goan shadow dancer because you know it it has this habit of um, you know being in uh, preferring shadows you know uh, or and and also it's got this hovering you know kind of bouncy dancing kind of flight. Um, we saw this first in two thousand eight, um, and the paper was published in two thousand thirteen. Okay, it took us took five years to be able to describe this species. So it's not uh, easy, uh, takes time, and uh, but it's a huge, huge learning experience. Thanks to some wonderful people that I met along the way, and they are they have become amazing friends and mentors uh, who have helped in this entire journey. So uh, this was the first one, and then luckily in two thousand thirteen we found another one. Okay, which got published, uh, you know, in, after another five years. Okay, in 2018. Uh, so this we named uh, flower annulatus after the uh, annular rings. You know, this yellow uh, flower is yellow uh, in Latin. So uh, these yellow rings that you see is named after that. Um, so yes, these two species, and then like I said earlier, probably another uh, species new to science uh, uh, will happen in the uh, in the future. All right. So you know, but but um, things are not um, uh, what I would expect them to be. Frankly, as far as Goa is concerned, um, 108 is a nice figure to throw around, saying that we have 108 species uh, in the state. Uh, but what we have done is basically just created an inventory. We are just seeing we have 108 species. We have absolutely no idea about you know what their distribution is. You know what are their abundances. You know population. You know seasonality. Uh, we have absolutely no idea, you know, and uh, about all this. Inventory is just the first step. It's the first step in the ladder, and it just tells you, you know, what we what we have and what we don't. But we need to really, uh, you know, take all those uh, uh, other steps to be able to look at conservation. You know, um, breeding biology is another uh, area which needs to be looked at. Um, I mean, this is not just for Goa, but for the entire country, I guess. That we know very little about um, the you know, breeding biology, ecology of these amazing insects. They being water dependent, and you know our wetlands are not in the best of health everywhere. Uh, I'm sure it will have some or the other impact on these species, this entire group. So understanding their requirements, understanding you know their breeding biology is so 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 crucial. Uh, and only if after you do all these things, then you can you know actually claim to be taking any positive conservation decisions or you know actually getting into the planning thing so we have taken just the baby steps uh, what actually we need is more people on the ground um, which unfortunately uh, in the state i don't see uh, people are interested but uh, not really interested you know in going that extra mile uh, to be able to do you know good science so we need more field workers uh, on the ground documenting. You know, we need more eyes, not just eyes. People, you know, foot soldiers, as I would call them, on the ground to be able to do all this. Uh, and this is not something that you know one person uh, can be, uh, will be able to do in his or her own one lifetime. We need a lot of people, you know, coming forward. Um, right, you know, but everything's not bad at least on the india india scene uh, scene and it's actually quite a few positives um, some south indian states are really doing amazing work kerala for that matter um, and uh, so you know there is this uh, uh, network called dragonfly south asia it was called dragonfly india earlier because you know most of us were from india but now we have got people joining us from sri lanka from bhutan you know from Different, uh, you know, South East, uh, South Asian countries. So we are calling it Dragonfly South Asia now, and this forum has connected a lot of, you know, serious, serious researchers, enthusiasts, and you know, amateurs like us. Um, this is a, uh, a example, uh, ex a good example of uh, uh, how you know people from different uh, fields, people from you know different um, walks of life, uh, can come together for a, you know, uh, for a common interest. And, uh, and amazing networking has happened um, till date. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, I thought I just check with everybody, you know. Otherwise, I remain. I keep on talking. All right. So, um, so this is a you know uh, a good forum to be part of. Uh, we have a Facebook group of more than seven thousand members. 
and uh, a lot of these people, you know, contribute some amazing data. Uh, uh, people have networked through this and have published, you know, a lot of new records. You know, have learned a lot, have uh, even published new species to science. And these are all, you know, different um, logos that you see, uh, you know, are part of this. There's a beautiful website, you know, called Odonata of India, a nice peer-reviewed resource, um, you know, to refer to. So, yeah, I think I'll, it's it's a call for to everybody to, you know, be part of this uh, amazing, amazing network. And we do something very, very interesting. We do, uh, you know, yearly annual meets. Okay. Uh, these are meets where, again, you know, researchers, Amateurs, who everybody, the you know, students come together, and we've been doing this since 2014. I have hosted one in Goa. Uh, this this picture that you see, you know, on the, in the left corner, is from one of the streams, uh, you know, near the Kure, uh, on near, very close to Dutsagar. Um, people come together, exchange ideas. You know, we have microscopes there. You know, we look at specimens. You know, go out exploring in the field. There's huge amount of learning that happens. So, I really, I would encourage. People who are interested in this group, you know, to to join Dragonfly South Asia, you know, and, and not just learn but contribute as well. Right. So I think uh, this is my last slide. That's my contact on your screen. Um, that's my email and my number. So anybody from the state um, who's interested in you know exploring this world of dragonflies is, you know, more, I mean, I'm more than happy to share and uh, you know willing to willing to connect. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening in patiently. Uh, any questions anybody has, uh, I'll be happy to answer. So Anushka, over to you. Thank you so much, Parag, for that. That was wonderful. And we can really clearly hear the passion that you have for these dragonflies and hansel flies through your talk. So once again, a big thank you. Uh, we're open to take questions at this point. So if anybody from the audience has questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or if you don't wish to, you can also uh, type your question in the chat box and I'll be happy to read it out. So any questions from the audience? Yeah, I'm audible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Uni Al from Dehradun, just retired from Scientists of Wildlife Institute of India. And I already conducted a large number of studies on dragonflies of the Western Himalayas and Great Himalayan National Parks and other areas. Some of the students already completed it. And I'm very thankful that is very fantastic uh, lectures and information about the dragonflies of Goa. So it, will, it is possible that we have not done the study of migration of dragonflies here. So I just request Dr. Parag, it is possible that can switch on the studies towards him basically on this on migration pattern because we have done this study of ecology and taxonomy and other as a indicators but definitely this important aspect is lacking in this Himalaya because during uh, high snowfall certainly they migrate towards the lower valleys of Alex and uh, other also it is possible that can uh, joint approach and you can just initiate the works with us and our student on migration patterns of dragonflies of the Himalayas. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there are uh, already some members uh, uh, within the Dragonfly. I think Shuvendu, if I uh, remember. Yeah, Shuvendu is my student. Yeah, he's doing PhD, but he's not. Yeah, he's doing. He's, I think so fully will submit his thesis very soon. He's already conducted the studies of Dragonflies of this whole Gangotri landscape, started from this Gomuk, this uh, origin of River Ganges, and up to the full uh, Ganges stretch also, but not the migration pattern. It's very, I think, so very, it will be very interesting. You can uh, do the, some small studies, small projects with us and the migration studies of the well, well, I'll be happy to collaborate, sir. But right now, frankly, my focus is Goa. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, we definitely. So much, yes. so much more to do here. So, uh, 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 yes, but you know, by the way, I mean, just just to share, fifteenth uh, uh, May to the twenty third, we are actually going to uh, you know the Great Himalayan National Park, and I hope to see a few. Oh, Great Himalayan. Himalayan. Okay, recently we already published a paper of Great Himalayan National Parks and uh, two or three students. I have done the longest study in the park. Long back, I mainly conducted the study of six years in 1995 to the 2000 and more than that. Yes, I'm associated with the Gate Wellness Park and all papers and the things already available. Yes, fantastic and a very interesting 
discussion and testing facts you have discussed today are very good for the student also. And I'm happy that large number of students have joined. The focus is going towards invertebrates, mainly on this type of uh, indicator species. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course. There's a question by Mr. Sanjay Verma. Uh, it says, uh, dragonflies are carnivores in their entire life cycle. They never, yeah, absolutely. They are, they are, they are uh, completely, you know, um, predators. Uh, you know, in not not uh, just carnivores. They are, you know, amazing predators. And um, underwater, they they feed on, um, you know, anything that they can overpower, including again, like I said, their own species, tadpoles. You know, uh, your blood worms. Uh, tiny fish uh, and in the uh, you know uh, in the aerial life as adults they are wing predators they'll catch things in um, you know on wing so you know and what is interesting is that their um, um, you know uh, success rate is much 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 higher than uh, even the tiger you know I mean they claim to the dragonflies uh, claim to fame is uh, uh, more than 90% success. You know, uh, I think uh, the success percentage of a tiger is uh, probably around 10 or, you know, even, even probably lesser. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, amazing predators they are. Uh, we have a, a question from Heta. She's raised her hand, so maybe she can unmute herself. And ask. Thank you, Anushka. A great presentation, Parag, as always. Uh, so thank you for that. I have a, uh, you have to pardon my ignorance. But uh, I was just thinking, suppose you take a species, pin it down, kill it to study it. What are the chances of the last of the species being caught like that and you lose it completely? Uh, that's so theoretically possible. <laughs> theoretically possible. But uh, but um, I, I don't think that's so. So there's a very interesting uh, paper uh, by Dr. Kumar Gorpade, okay, about how collections can actually be beneficial for insect conservation, okay, uh, because I mean it has it has a lot of a lot of benefits in terms of because I think you know uh, collections I'm not seeing unwarranted collections you know which random collections and if if collections can be be very focused. Uh, then you know, insect collection is not something that will render uh, a species extinct. Uh, that would be you know uh, something that would be a very far-fetched thing. But like I said, on the lighter side, theoretically possible. Uh, but it's 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 yeah yeah. So but it's it's important because uh, uh, collections help you establish you know the species. Uh, I mean, without knowing what you have, the, uh, how do you conserve it? Right? So, and in, uh, for example, in case of birds, now you don't have to collect a specimen anymore. Mm -hmm. But in case of insects, uh, you have to, like it or not. Uh, thanks for that, Para. We have uh, two more questions. Uh, I'll come to Tahir in a bit, but first I will ask the question by Chinmay. Now, I'll read it out for you. Uh, he says that uh, before today, I was not aware about dragonflies. Uh, and I'm interested to know more about them. And I would also like to volunteer on field. Uh, how can I get a chance to contribute on field for studying the dragonfly diversity and other aspects about them? Over to you, Paran. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm not sure where he's from, but uh, I think uh, I'm sure you'll find some uh, you know, dragonfly South Asia member around where, where, where you live. Uh, you know, so I think the best way is to connect with uh, like-minded people around you. Uh, I'm sure there'll be people, you know, who are interested in dragonflies or already studying dragonflies. Uh, or, Gre you know, if, uh, Sorry. Uh, no, and I think someone's uh, unmuted themselves. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. So I was, I was saying that, you know, uh, best is to connect or, you know, if uh, you need help, we can help you uh, connect as well with uh, people who are interested. So I think that's the first thing that uh, anybody has to do if you're interested in the subject, you know, network, and then, you know, just spend time on the field. You know, you will automatically end up contributing. Uh, that's, that's my take. Great. Thanks, Parag. Uh, we could have Tahir uh, ask that question, please. They've raised their hand. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dada. I have a simple question that uh, 
apart from the ones that hibernate, what happens to the dragonflies generally in winters when it's a lot of snow? And how do we see it? Yeah, yeah. Eid Mubarak, by the way. <laughs> I, <in advance. laughs> I actually, I should be asking you this question, man. Uh, I, I live in a tropical land, you know, I live by the coast. <laughs> where there are no winters and no snow, of course. Uh, so, yeah, well, I uh, I think they, you know, uh, I mean, uh, what possibly uh, must be happening is that in one of the stages, they must be, you know, kind of... Uh, I'm sure they hibernate, you know, in, in probably the um, nymphal stage uh, throughout, throughout, throughout the uh, tougher times. I mean, that's the only logical, you know, explanation. No, no, I'm talk talking about the uh, adult ones because we get like the second year or a third or first year or a second year adult dragonfly. How is it possible that if they do not hibernate, how is it possible? And there's nothing like going uh, further to Shivaliks because to go into the Shivaliks or the lesser Himalayas, they have to cross 4,000 meters. So that will be hint to the migration. So it's like, I believe it's very uh, interesting to understand, but is there any studies that... that, I, that frankly have, I frankly have no ideas. Maybe Shuendu will be able to, you know, throw, throw light on it. But uh, yeah, something that needs to be explored. Like I said earlier, I, I, we, we just know our species. We don't know so much about them. Right, right. right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dada. Thank you. Thank you. I have a follow-up from Chinmay. Uh, he says, I'm from Maharashtra. Can you also suggest a guide for dragonfly identification? Suggest a guide? Uh, okay. Uh, like, you know, the, I think the Odonata of India uh, is an excellent website, Chinmay. Um, uh, Maharashtra is a huge state. Where exactly are you from? <laughs> so, uh, if you can uh, just let me know where you are from. Maybe, you know, I'm sure there will be somebody in Maharashtra, you know, who can connect. I think if you are around Pune, uh, Pankaj is a great guy to connect with. Pankaj Koparade. Uh, he's already doing projects, uh, you know, uh, on the entire uh, Western Guards. Uh, he's documenting Dragonfly. So you can you know, join the team, you know, team up with him. So he's there. If you go up, if you are from Nagpur side, you know, there's, there are Dr. Andrews there in Nagpur. Then, uh, you know, quite a few people actually, if you let us know where you're from, Maybe we can pinpoint you know, whom you can connect with. Um, as far as, uh, I don't think there's any guide uh, or field guide for Dragonflies of Maharashtra specifically, but uh, there are quite a few uh, field guides now, uh, including there's one for Delhi, you know, there's one for Western India, a very good guide uh, for Western India. Um, and then there are the websites, you know, Odonata of India is a good website to refer to. Uh, I think, Hello. Yeah. Yes. Please go ahead. So I am from Pune, itself. Ah, then I think you should connect with Pankaj Koparde. Um, I forget the name of his university. He teaches MIT, uh, MIT uh, University in Pune. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chinmay, if I just shared my uh, email and contact number earlier, if you have made a note. Uh, just text me and I'll share Pankaj's number with you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that is all uh, from for the questions. I don't see anyone else raising their hand or asking in the chat box. Uh, great. Thanks a lot again, Parak for this talk and for sharing so much with us. It's been amazing to listen to you. Uh, and thanks everyone for the great turnout and for asking a lot of interesting questions. Um, so with this, uh, we conclude and thanks again everyone for their efforts and support and hope to see you all again in the next uh, series, uh, which will happen sometime in June. Uh, thank you so much, Parag. This was great. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure, thank you. Okay, I will end the um zoom call now yeah